Scott. Mark. I'm, I'm ready to watch the next 77 episodes, or maybe 76 if we just forget about Turnabout Intruder. First of all, you know, with, with all the work that, that, that you guys have done over these years, inside and outside of Star Trek, isn't it great just to geek out and watch these episodes on a big screen like this? I love watching the episodes, uh, just in general, even when I play them alone in my head. <laughs> But seeing them on, on, the, on the big screen with a bunch of people and hearing the reactions is so great. I, I agree. We've got to do gotta this say, more. When, when that red shirt died in a... <laughs> <laughs> I just, like, was not expecting that. But it was right before he died that the big reaction came. <laughs> yeah. It was like the big, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, oh, Mark, uh, listen, I picked these two particular episodes for a reason. But what is it about? There has to be a reason. There has to be a reason. It was a trap. Uh, there, were, there was obviously a, a, a lot of reasons. But what is specifically Balance of Terror is just one of the greatest Star Trek episodes ever produced in 55 years. Why does it hold up? Uh, there, there's so many reasons, you know. And a lot of shows in the 60s, you know, they were knocking off other movies. I mean, Battlestar Galactica 78 did it horribly when they did, you know, Fire in Space, which was the towering inferno in space. This is the way you knock off a TV, uh, an old movie uh, <laughs> because it's, you know, it's the enemy below, you know, with Robert Mitchum and Kurt Jurgens. But uh, it's a great version, and it doesn't really show its influence too much. I mean, yeah, it's a submarine movie in space, but ultimately what it's really about is you know understanding our enemy, and uh, it's a rebuke of xenophobia and racism. You know, and it's much more subtle than something that everybody talks about, like the documentaries about "Let That Be Your Last Battlefield," where it's black on one side and white on the other, and it's so heavy-handed, and everybody talks about like, "Oh, Star Trek was so ahead of us." Like Balance of Terror does it really well and subtle, and it's just such a marvelous episode. And what was really interesting, I don't know if you intended this, the contrast between a Gene Roddenberry episode and a Gene Kuhn episode in Arena, because they both deal with similar themes, but you can really see how Kuhn leans into the character and into the humor, and, you know, and, and ultimately the, the message at the end, but even Spock, who is so borderline jingoistic in Balance of Terror is the one counseling restraint in Arena. And then you have that scene, of course, in Balance of Terror, which is um, really right out of the cage. It's the same scene he wrote for John Hoyt and, um, and, and Jeffrey Hunter, but it's done even better in Balance of Terror. Agreed. Did you notice that in um, Balance of Terror, the Romulan commander says, we've got him. And Kirk says the same thing in Arena. I never noticed that. I, but, but you know what, Mark, I did. And it, what was the 80th time you've seen it, charitably? <laughs> 180th time? 108. But no, I did pick, the, pick these episodes for, for a reason, and, um, many reasons, among them being because they are similar, but the tones are very different because of the two genes. Darren, what, what wow, this is a loaded question. <laughs> The, the difference between Gene Roddenberry and, and Gene Kuhn. What did Gene Kuhn bring to Star Trek that, that was missing for the first half of the first season? Amphetamines. <laughs> you know, I think that Gene Kuhn brought actually a, a broader background in terms of uh, drama and uh, making a story interesting for an audience. Um, uh, though, you know, Gene Roddenberry was an amazing writer. Gene Kuhn also didn't take it quite as seriously. So he could afford to have maybe a little more fun, maybe a little more humor, uh, but definitely some really important character moments. Um, the, the, great, the great path of Kirk in Arena specifically, of him being a, a vengeful killer at the beginning, you know, when he finds out what's happened to Cestus III, and then his turn, as it, as it occurs during his fight, it's, uh, it's, it's, again, really subtle, but it's really magical when you see it happen. I mean, they were both veterans. I mean, Roddenberry uh, was a veteran of World War II. Kuhn was. He fought in Korea, also Kuhn. And he was a, a journalist and an author. Um, Kuhn had a lot of writing experience, of course. Rod Roddenberry was a speechwriter for William Parker. But... Um, in a lot of ways, they were very similar, and it, it is a personal crusade of mine to extol Gene Kuhn, because of course he died in 1973 of lung cancer, 
And so he didn't get to go to all the conventions and he didn't get to sign all the autographs and he didn't, you know, get to be self-aggrandizing. And I say that with love and any, you know, but, uh, and it's a shame because he is, you know, the beating heart of that show. And even here you see the evolution from command base to uh, the Federation and all the things that um, Gene Kuhn was bringing, like the Klingons, like um, the United Federation of Planets, like the Prime Directive uh, in other episodes. Kuhn was a genius and sometimes doesn't get the love that he deserves, the recognition. What, what big contribution, and we're not showing this one, but he created the Klingons in Errand of Mercy. That's Gene Kuhn. And Darren, I want to ask you, so, so you, you know, you, you talked about, Mark, you were talking about how, uh, how, how the, you know, compared to other shows, you know, like Lost in Space, and you had, I mean, Gilligan's Island, I Dream of Genie, and, and like Gomer Pyle, and then you have a show like Star Trek, which you know, Roddenberry intended for Star Trek to, to be a subtle metaphor for the times. But Gene Kuhn took that ball and he ran with it. Like if you look at like Devil in the Dark and Never to Mercy, like he really leaned into that a little more, didn't he? Let's be careful not to denigrate Gilligan's Island and I Dream of Genie. <laughs> um, because they have a special place in my heart too. Uh, but yeah, Gene Kuhn, um, as I was saying before, he was a, a master storyteller. You know, he, he wasn't necessarily the big world builder the way Gene Roddenberry was, but he knew individually story-wise how to give those characters the proper beats, how to be uh, subtle with the, uh, with the moral message, and yet still be exactly on target with what he intended from the episode. He also walked the walk. You know, Gene Kuhn's assistant was a woman named Andrea Kindred, who was the first African-American assistant at Desilu and later at Paramount, who he hired to be his assistant. And she was good friends with Martin Luther King and with Kanenga and with um, uh, Malcolm X. And so uh, Kuhn was really interested in her. And, like, and his father had been a Klansman. Kuhn. So it's really uh, amazing, and he was, you know, super liberal and super progressive, um, and the, how far he'd come from the upbringing that he had. He was a really remarkable guy, and, you know, we were lucky enough on the podcast to have Andrea come on and talk about her experience, you know, with Gene, and it's really remarkable. You know, by the way, that episode you were talking about, Let That Be Your Last Battlefield, that heavy-handed, beating you over the head episode, we're showing that tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. Can we stay and watch Aaron Mercy tonight at midnight, keep the lights yeah, on? Yeah, that, that would be great. <laughs> I, I'm down with that. Yeah, Darren, I, you know, Mark, you brought up a, another thing, too, about, about the shift, the, the, the fact that our, our main characters learn. And one, one thing that I've always loved about Star Trek, there's a lot, uh, but one thing was just that people always sort of on the surface said, oh, Star Trek is about the perfection of humanity. And that's wrong. It's about the striving, striving. We're always going to be learning. We're never going to be perfect. If we're not perfect in the 21st century, we're not going to be perfect in the 23rd century. We will hopefully be better, but we'll keep learning. But and look how Kirk dismisses Spock in Arena. He's really a jerk to him, yeah, right? He's but it sinks in, and by the end of the episode, he's processed what Spock has said and acts on it. So, you know, people can argue and people can have fights and people can disagree, but ultimately the common good, you know, brings them together, you know? And, it and was, that's why it was so realistic. It was only this uh, quote, perfection of humanity that occurred after the series was over, after Gene began going on his lecture tours and talking to colleges and creating this mythos that wasn't necessarily there during the series. How many times have you been to Vasquez Rocks, Scott? Oh, like a dozen, <laughs> a dozen. Yeah. In fact, there's a great story. I don't know if this is true. Uh, it might be like, a, you know, print the legend kind of thing. But, you know, in 1966, so Vasquez Rocks is a national park. Obviously, they filmed tons of TV shows and films there. Sure. But it's because it's a national park, you cannot close it off when they are filming. You can film there, you can go there, but you can't close it off. Oh, I know. So, so <laughs> <laughs> yes, you sure do. Uh, so, uh, boy, that's a whole other story. So one day in 1966, a family, from, a family of four from Oklahoma, they, they went to Vasquez Rocks for a, for a day in the park, and they were having a picnic, enjoying the weather, and suddenly around the corner comes this thing. <laughs> Why is everything we don't understand always called a thing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need you. 
Uh, so, so yeah, that family was never heard from again. But I do want to talk about how <laughs> <laughs> I do want to talk about how you know. So for for both of these episodes, and you're right. I mean, in Arena, he's much more aggressive about his pursuit of the Gorn. But in both episodes, when the Enterprise is in pursuit of the Romulan and in the Gorn ship, in one episode, Kirk is he's a little more uh, brooding about it, and the other one, he's more aggressive. But he's he's after them, and then he changes. He he after almost destroying the Romulan, he extends a hand of compassion. And after almost killing the Gorn, he says, no, I'm not going to kill you. Like, let's, th that shift is important, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, it's super important. Uh, I mean, but again, it's that whole message of understanding your enemy. And what you said at the beginning, that, the, you know, the Star Trek often didn't have villains, they had antagonists. So, you know, the Gorn was an antagonist. And once you really get to know your antagonist, you realize that maybe you know, there's a reason behind the way they're acting. It, it's so important, the fact that this was created in the 60s when, you know, the Russians were, our, you know, our adversaries, the Chinese, and, you know, they're saying to understand your enemy. You know, and it, it really, uh, in so many ways, you know, past the headlines, Star Trek really was ahead of its time. And, of course, you know, all the cliches about, oh, the communicator and the technology and the sliding doors, all that's true. But, you know, socially or politically, it is remarkable how ahead of the times it was. In, uh, and and it's, there's still lessons to be learned just watching that now. I mean, look at Styles. I mean, you said it yourself at the beginning. Um, leave any bigotry you have in your quarters. You know, he, Kirk shuts that down right away. He, yeah, he shuts it down perfectly. It's su such a great moment. Darren, I want to ask you, so, so the thing about, about, about the original show, as it was being produced, especially the, the first season, the first two seasons, which are the best. So... During those times, this is the late 60s, you had civil rights, uh, you had the protests, you had Vietnam, you had the Cold War. I mean, there was so much going on, so much bleakness at once. It was really just a very, very, very difficult time, sound familiar. But then you had the show that addressed these issues, but in a positive way, in an aspirational way. Uh, why was Star Trek, Darren, why was Star Trek the show that, that we needed at the time? Why is Star Trek the show we need now? Well, I think the answer is that because the writing, again, there's that subtlety, that the story can be interesting enough for kids to watch it, for us to watch it. And, you know, we didn't get all of the, you know, political... Uh, uh, information from it. We didn't, we didn't know what the big picture was. We didn't know how it related to real life. But now we do. And you can grow along with it. You know, as you learn, you begin making these connections saying, oh, that's what they were doing. And it's really magical. But the, the point is to make it, the first job was to make it an entertaining show so that people would watch it. And then you put in the, you know, the juicy stuff for later, you know, for the audience to realize it later. It's not bonk, bonk on the head to, you know, <laughs> quote a phrase. I get the mirror <laughs> reference. <laughs> and look, let's, let's also throw the skirball bone. You know, Star Trek also, in, in Judaism, there's a thing called tikkun olam, which is repair the world. And, you know, it's aspirational. And the same thing with Star Trek. It is projecting a better world and how we can live together to make the world better and something to strive for. That we may never achieve that, but we, it, it's the striving that makes it worthwhile. Yeah. And um, I think that's, you know, part of Star Trek is very aspirational. When it's at its best, you, you, you want to be these characters you, and you want to live in that world. We still want to be these characters. Uh, I, I just want to, if, if you have any questions, if anybody has any questions, you know, we got two microphones up here on the stage, so, so come on and down. And four lights. And, and uh, there are <laughs> four lights. You are crossing the streets. I the only TOS see three lights, gen. Mark. <laughs> Wrong show. We got a question right over here. Why don't you start, start off? I'd like you to comment on maybe a less progressive aspect of one of these episodes, and that's the treatment of women. And I'm talking about, especially the contrast in uh, the first one, uh, Balance of Terror, where you've got Yeoman Rand hanging all over Kirk and him putting his arm around her. And yet, the woman who's going to get married is one of the phaser chiefs. Exactly. So, the, so you've got a dichotomy there, <laughs> a little sexism, but a little progression. Can you talk about that? 
I, 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 will, I will say this. Uh, you're absolutely right to point that out. And that's one of the reasons why the character of Rand was dropped from the original series. Uh, and, you know, also... Grace well, they Hubert. wanted to open him up to other love interests other than well, Rand. Well, that too. So. That but, too. But, but, uh, but, but they're... You know, he's right. It, it, it was progressive. You had, you had a woman in engineering in charge. Uh, of course. It, it, you've got to put in the context of the era. And if you look at the roles for women on other shows, I mean, Star Trek was remarkable, even though you never saw it till the animated series. You know, Uhura was like fifth in line for the captaincy. Um, and, you know, if you look at... And she just steps up to the navigator spot and, in, and, that, and in that you, spot. You, you know, she you, can do everything on the bridge. If you look at, you know, a lot of Kirk's, um, you know, ex-girlfriends, they're all... You know, um, Commodores and, and people yeah. with responsive and JAG officers. And they all still liked him and, except that last one. You know, and, and so I think, you know, for the time, it's incredibly, um, you know, empowering. But, you know, there are certain tropes of the era. And, and also, it's a great shot, too. <laughs> I think what, what Roddenberry actually spoke about was that, you know, it's about choice. I mean, it, you know... The, the honoring and respecting of women includes all the choices that they want to make. You know, if Rand wanted to be by Kirk's side, as she did in a couple episodes, then let her choose that. And to Kirk's credit, Kirk always was keeping her at arm's length. Absolutely. Kirk was, you know, there was the implication that Rand was interested and wanted a romantic relationship with Kirk. And, you know, Kirk, because he was a superior officer, never pursued that. Yeah. Uh, uh, not quite. In uh, the enemy within, he well, but that yeah, doesn't but that's count. Bad that episode. was the evil Kirk. <laughs> that was the evil Kirk from episode number five. Get a life. <laughs> what Next kept the Kirk safe number? Um, Mr. Mans, you you mentioned you know like uh, let this be your last battlefield as so blatant, which to me it needed to be blatant because I like you. I think Star Trek, obviously it started in 66, but for me, I didn't get into it till the 70s when it was on KTLA on Saturdays and Sundays at five. Um, that's when I first started realize, that show was the first show that made me realize what Star Trek was about versus just fantasy. And what you guys mentioned is how it's really about the people and the cast development. That's why I think when you selected Star Trek II for the movie last week, why that was so monumentally different than the motion picture. Not that I didn't enjoy it, but the difference was the motion picture was about technology and Star Trek's successes were the people. Well, well I will say this about the motion picture. Star Trek, the motion picture, it, it, it wasn't appreciated for this at the time, but Star Trek, the motion picture actually is a quintessential Star Trek story. Especially the director's edition. <laughs> but I will say this too, by the way, you're, you're talking up here to three guys who, who are part of the syndication generation of Star Trek. That's the generation that made Star Trek popular, and that's why we're here. So, by the way, speaking of which, what was the first episode you saw? I have no clue. I mean, I, I was watching when I was very young. Maybe it was the animated series. People always ask me this. Whenever they're interviewing me for documentaries, like, what was your first Star Trek? I have no idea. But I do want to say this. I, when I went to Vasquez Rocks for the first time, I was expecting to see that fort. I didn't realize that it was built for uh, the Bengal Lancers TV show and that it, because it was in, like, Mission Impossible and a bunch of stuff. But it had been torn down in the early 70s. I felt like, you know, I was, I was ripped off. I wanted the whole experience. I, I wanted the Cestus Three experience. I didn't get the food. I didn't get the, you know, the, the, the anything. I just got Commodore the big Commodore Travers, rock. long gone. Uh, what about you? Do you remember your first? Oh, absolutely. I, was I, I first got into Star Trek with the animated show. And it was very, you know, very few months later that I realized, oh, there's a live action one too. <laughs> um, but the first one, of course, was the uh, 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 Beyond the Farthest Star uh, episode of uh, the animated, which was creepy as hell. And it scared me as a kid and I loved it. Uh, and the first episode of the live action was uh, Devil in the Dark. That's a good one. <laughs> but all right. right, the animated series uh, won an Emmy for best uh, you know, uh, uh, children's show. And I got to say, some of those episodes, especially Yesteryear, written by Dorothy Fontana, would have made, can you imagine Yesteryear as a live action Where episode? are the episodes, Scott? <laughs> why, why, why didn't you program it? You loved it so much. Next Where weekend. Are the episodes? <laughs> we got another question right here. 
First, I have to confess I am a pre-syndication Star Trek fan. Back to it's all right. Uh, but because of the skirball activities, we made our first, Jenny and I made our first trip to Vasquez Rocks last month, which oh. is, it's well worth the trip for anybody who hasn't been there before. But when we prepared to go, um, Vasquez Rocks has this mythical presence in Star Trek from arena to being where Spock's mother died and appearing in Picard again. Is there, besides the backdrop, is there a backstory of why Absolutely. Star okay. It's because it's within what they call the 30-mile well. zone. <laughs> this is absolutely true. The 30-mile zone, which radiates from, I, I guess it's uh, Hollywood and Vine, uh, it's a, a union thing that if you take your remote location to something within the 30-mile zone, you don't have to pay for hotels. And it's the closest place within the zone that looks like an alien planet because there are not a lot of alien planets in the zone. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> ask his rock suit. If a starship enters the zone. zone. Uh, we've got another question right here. Thank you for that, by the way. So, I am also a child of syndication, but I was WPIX in New York. Yes. Yep. <laughs> 11 Alive. <laughs> Woo. Um, so you said something that I thought was really interesting, which is sort of the mythology that has grown up around Gene and Gene's dream. And, you know, in Star Trek fandom, there's a lot of talk about Gene's dream and Idik when he created Idik because he wanted to shell shiny, shiny doodads. <laughs> and so I'm wondering how you feel that that recreation of the origin story has affected the ongoing Star Trek projects and series. Wow, what a question. That's a good is. question. Um, Who wants to take that one? <laughs> well, I, I think I ought to take that as, uh, as Gene himself. Um, Gene would probably say that, you know, there are many stories that, uh, that are developed after uh, many years of telling, uh, telling the, the backstory of how everything happened. Um, but we have to realize that uh, one can be uh, directed in the direction of uh, making money and still have good... Uh, good intentions to everything else. I think, I think that Gene was many people and all of these facets of him um, created this larger than life persona that he helped create um, because it was useful for him to have this massive following of fans and he used that constantly to make his deals better at the studio. And he saved the show. Because he, he saved the show. Um, but I think that, yes, he was in it. He was in it to make money. But as he moved along, he also realized that it was a great opportunity to show the positivity, to show the direction that would be great for humanity to go in. And I think that at his heart, he was absolutely that kind of good person. Uh, you know... Um, there's an expression on the man, man saved Liberty Valance, a man killed Liberty Valance, you know, print the legend. And I think with Gene, we kind of print the legend, which is great because I think that is truly the man Gene wanted to be. And if he didn't live up to those ideals, at least he put them out there and inspired so many people. Yeah. And, and um, you know, everyone's flawed. And, um, you know, he's not a perfect guy and there are books that go into great length about it. Um, and there are amazing stories about the good, the bad, and the ugly of Gene Roddenberry. But he gave us this incredible gift, which we'll all be, you know, deeply grateful for the rest of our lives. So, you know, whatever his flaws and foibles, it is what it is, you know? Okay, last question real fast. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you guys for being here. Big fan of your podcast. Thank you. So I have, my question is this. I love the lineup of episodes you chose. You represented the first you know, four live action Star Trek series very well. So my question is this. If you had to pick one episode of Enterprise to add to this lineup, what would it be? <laughs> You're looking at us. Um, well, you know, it's funny. We, this week on, on Inglorious Trexperts is our episode. We're doing a whole run of, called Bible Study. Not Skirball Bible Study. It's on the Bibles of uh, the TV shows, the Writers and Producer Guides, which are called Series Bibles. So this week we did the Enterprise Bible. So 
if we had a show, if we, 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 we would whisper in Scott's ear about what he should show, um, and it wasn't yesteryear from the animated series, and it was an episode of Enterprise. Well, I mean, I would have to say uh, uh, Into the Mirror Darkly, the two, but that's two parts. Yeah, it's two um, parts. You know, and, and even, you know, maybe, um, what, Terry? I, I think, honestly, Broken Bow, which is the first, where'd he go? Uh, is the first episode. I mean, Broken Bow is one of the best, like, pilot episodes next to uh, DS9's uh, Emissary, uh, which is yeah, also fantastic. I, I like The Forge, I think, you yeah, know. Um, I, I, well, I, I don't, you know, look, this is supposed to be the best of Trek, so. <laughs> 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 well, I, I, will, I will say that, that regardless, I mean, first of all, it's a great question, uh, and, and trying to pick 10 representing all the shows out of 800 plus episodes. Uh, and then you got, you know, you've got the movies. Scott wanted to make all of them TOS, just so you know. Uh, that is true. I did. I don't um, disagree with him. Well, I, I, just the episodes that I'm not showing that I wanted to, and, and I'm sure you'll agree, Mirror, Mirror, A Mock Time, Where No Man Has Gone Before, and of course, because last week we had Wrath of Khan, Space Seed. So, you, you forgot uh, Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Oh, who here loves Metamorphosis? I, I love that episode. We know. Written by Gene Kuhn, directed by Ralph Sinetsky. So, ladies and gentlemen, please stick around. The best is yet to come. Although, thank you so much for a great conversation. Oh, yeah, stick and, around for the Akutas with City on the Edge. It's going to be and, awesome. And, and, ladies and gentlemen, please do check out their podcast, Inglorious Trexperts. If you do not listen to Inglorious Trexperts every week, you are missing out. How many check of out you Scott's have heard it. podcast. How many of Enterprise you have show of hands? Thank you. Oh. Oh, good. So now all of you can go listen to it, and we can get more listeners. Thank you so much, and stick around, because right now, ladies and thank gentlemen. Thank you, Scott. Thank, thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren and Mark. That was fun. <laughs>